Brazilian things. I'm not sure we'll be able to get through them all. I will go as quickly as I can. And what we can learn from the early church about worship today. Welcome back. Welcome. So let's start with a moment of silence. And then we'll greet each other with the ancient greeting. And thanks for meaning it so well last hour, those of you that were here. And um, after the ancient reading, I will pray. What we're going to look at in this hour are various practices of the early church. And these are practices not of the Catholics, but of the earlier church before it split, even between East and West. Um, and that will realize that, uh, that way you can realize that these come from right after the period when apostles knew Jesus Christ personally. You can think about that during the moment of silence. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you spoke through the person of Jesus Christ to the early disciples. And they passed on your word to the early believers. And the early believers formed worship in the church. And the early believers then give us models of what we can do in our worship today. Thank you for people who are here from various denominations so that we can share the wisdom of the church at large and increase the strength and flexibility and possibilities for all the denominations represented here. And we, through our discipleship, seek to pass on the wisdom of the church through the ages and the ages to your glory and for the sake of the world. Amen. I loved learning about liturgy in college because I had this wonderful professor who is also my organ professor. And uh, before I used to have a fat foot because of my crippled leg, I had a, I was able to play organ. But anyway, I never was very good, so it's just as well. <laughs> but I can't play organ anymore. Anyway, um, my organ professor was a dear saint of God. He was so godly that he was also the conductor of our choir that went around the world. And we'd be in countries where um, we didn't even speak, they didn't even speak a word of English. But he just had to walk on stage and the audience would go, oh. they would just gasp because he had such a holy demeanor. And he would walk on stage and they would know that they were in the presence of, God, of a servant of God. He was just a dear man. And his teaching about liturgy was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm always grateful to be able to share these pieces um, of what the early church used to use. And you can use as many of them as fit into your own worship planning. Um, as I said, I've gotten criticism before. Oh, that's too Catholic. Um, especially because Baptists primarily have broken away from Catholic kind of rituals. And yet these rituals are full of meaning if you can understand them. And you might find them really helpful. Um, just like the, I always do, the Lord be with you and also with you. That's one of the greetings that is part of the rituals that are used that I'm going to describe this morning. So. The first one is the invocation. And I'm sorry that I did not get for you because uh, I was out of town and didn't get the email in time. Um, I only get the emails after I get home from my assistant who prints them up for me because I'm visually impaired. Um, that I was going to have a list of these particular practices 
and then we can go over them together, but I didn't get that sheet printed, so you'll have to take it down yourself. But that'll keep you awake anyway. <laughs> Since it's the end of a very busy week for y'all. Invocation. And invocation, I found, is extremely helpful because you know when you start. I have been in some churches that have no invocation, and they start with what they call gathering music. And during the gathering music, all kinds of people wander in, and you never know when you really start because they just wander in throughout the gathering music, and then you just kind of gather. <laughs> Sort of, kind of, kind of gather. And you never know when you start. But an invocation makes it decisive. This is a starting time. And during this time, we are gathered here. And the real value of an invocation, I just said that to be funny. The real value of an invocation is that it reminds us that we gather in the name of God. So most invocations say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And people cross themselves. Now, lest you think that's too Catholic, <laughs> let me explain what that means. It means when you cross yourself, and I'd like to maybe have you do it together with me, um, I want God in my mind. I want God to be the center of my will. That's what your heart is. And I want God to be in the center of all my actions so that my actions give glory to God. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And um, I like to cross myself wherever I begin worship. So I did yesterday over in the chapel at Truett Seminary, um, because I like to be remembering that I'm in the presence of the triune God, and it's in the triune name that I worship, and that I want God to be the center of my thinking, the center of my will, and the center of everything that I do. That's why you point to your shoulders. It stands for action. Okay? Make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The second thing that uh, is a piece that the early church has emphasized is confession and absolution. Now I want to stress that we want to get the confession um, nice and early. The reason it's put early in the liturgy is so that we can get sin out of the way. That sin is not in our way when we gather for worship. Now, in order to do that, you want the confession to be deep enough. I really like um, a memorized confession that I learned as a child. That um, I, I say, you say, Oh God, most merciful Father, we confess that we are in bondage to sin. And I really like that. If I state that I'm in bondage to sin, I realize that, you know, um, I sin whether I like to or not. You know, I sin um, because I'm too self-centered as soon as I get up in the morning. You know, as soon as I get up in the morning, I think, oh, I'm still tired. Instead of thinking about God. I don't know about y'all what your first thought is in the morning, but I never like the alarm clock to ring. <laughs> Even though I slept really well last night, thanks for your prayers. Some of you told me that yesterday. Because um, I hadn't slept well the nights before because of getting up at 3.30 in the morning and being afraid I wouldn't wake up. Anyway, this morning I woke up and thought, oh, I want to get up. Which is sin already when God calls you to service. So um, you sin, you want to make sure, I mean, I'm in bondage to sin. You want to make sure that your confession is deep enough and it covers all the ways in which you sin. <clears throat> so I'm in bondage to sin, cannot free myself. I have sinned against you with my whole heart. I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Now, I, the reason I like that is um, one time I was in a congregation that didn't have a deep enough prayer. And in their prayer, they said, Oh God, I often say things I wish I didn't say. Well, I work really hard to not let any unwholesome talk come out of my mouth, but only that which is good for edifying. 
because of a practice I encountered with young people once when I was leading them in a youth retreat. It was a high school retreat. And uh, we were talking about words that we say, and we didn't want any unwholesome talk to come out of our mouths, which is a translation of Ephesians 4. And um, I had said that um, we so easily malign other people, or we so easily say things we wish we hadn't said. And so by just confessing that my <coughs> words were often not very good, that confession didn't go deep enough. I thought, ah, I can escape that one. Of course, I have all the ugly thoughts. <laughs> so that's why I like saying thoughts, words, and deeds. You know, and it gets me one way or the other. I, I, have, I have sinned in one of those ways already this morning. By what I have done and what I have left undone. Mm -hmm. So either I've done it or I've failed to do it. Mm -hmm. That covers everything. I've sinned against you with my whole self. And that's the kind of confession that we need in our worship services. So whatever confession you write, and sometimes worship planners like y'all do write the confession, make sure it's deep enough. And similarly, make the words of forgiveness clear enough. A lot of times, um, the liturgy or the worship order whatever you're following in your denomination um, includes a word of forgiveness, but it isn't clear enough. It's just um, that God likes to forgive sins, but um, does he forgive mine? The poor sinner in the pew who has just dumped his heart out doesn't really receive any assurance that his sins are forgiven. You know, I love to hear, in the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive you your sins. You know, you can just keep that up if you're a sinner. And I love on Sunday morning to dump out how I'm in bondage to sin, how I cannot free myself, how I've sinned in thought, word, and deed, and then to hear a clear word of forgiveness. That just frees me to worship. Okay? Yeah. So it's very important that the word of forgiveness be clear. Do you suggest a confession even if it's just a Latin service? Um, it depends on the situation. I prefer to have a confession because that gives me the chance always to hear clearly the word of forgiveness. Um, because we go around with guilt all the time anyway. Um, but according to certain Latin services, there's no confession included. So if it's a book of common prayer, for example, Latin service, there's no word confession included. Depends upon the community. Sometimes I've heard people complain, there's too much confession of sins around here. I don't see how there can ever be too much. But some people feel overwhelmed by it, but maybe that's because they haven't heard clearly enough that they're forgiven. Mm -hmm. Confession and absolution, another piece is the introit, I N T R O I T, which is the entrance hymn. And a lot of times this is simply composed of a song. In the ancient book of worship, the common book of prayer, it, the book of common prayer in the Anglican communion, um, there are certain introits listed that change every Sunday. Um, so that the, for example, the third week of Advent is uh, Laetari, no, it's Rejoice Sunday, I forget the, the uh, Latin word. Um, anyway, and their intro is Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I'll say Rejoice, and that's also one of the scripture texts for today. But a lot of times the intro has come out of the Psalms. O come, let us worship the Lord. Or you might in Matins sing Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise before the rock of our salvation. 
Um, you might know a song to that. I usually break out and sing it, but I think I'm hoarse of voice this morning. Would that be the final call to worship? Yes. It's a call to worship. Thank you. The next piece is Kyrie Eleison. And some of you might know it by that Latin. Christe Eleison. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. And it's simply usually sung. Um, but let me remind you, this is not Lord have mercy because I'm a sinner. This is Lord have mercy on the world. The Kyrie eleison is not another confession of sin. The Kyrie eleison is a prayer for the sake of the world. <coughs> the peace of the world well-being of the Church of God, the unity of all. Another piece is the Gloria in Excelsis, and some of you might know that from the Latin Mass, and all the Masses of the various saints, including very whose mass sounds more like an opera, but it is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. The glory in excelsis is, is almost like revelation. It's just praising God for this and this and this and this and this. <clears throat> it's almost like glossolalia. <laughs> it's a singing about all the things that God has done as Trinity. Glory to God in the highest, This is um, any sort of hymn of praise. So um, many times the church musician puts in some sort of hymn of praise at this point in the worship service. And remember, yesterday we distinguished between praise and thanksgiving. Some of you weren't here yesterday when we did that. Um, thanksgiving is for what God has given to me personally. Praise is for who God is, um, God's character. And so we can always praise no matter what's going on in our lives. Um, thanksgiving is sometimes a little harder to do depending upon what's happening in our lives. Also yesterday we had a brief discussion about, um, um, oh that reminds me, would you remind me but I have to take pills at 10 o'clock. <laughs> because that's 8 o'clock time back home. And um, 8 o'clock every day in the morning and at night is when I have to have my uh, immunosuppressants. They're supposed to be every 12 hours. So I'd appreciate it if you make sure I take it at 10. Okay? Yeah, okay. And then there's something called the colic. And what the colic is, is a prayer about the theme of the day. And the colic is another one of the preppers. Um, if any of you follow, you know, to, to, in, or, in order for me to talk with you better, I should know what denominations are here. Um, uh, how many of you are Baptists? Please raise your hands. Raise your hands high, I'm visually impaired. I can only see your hand by its contrast in color. <laughs> okay, how many of you are Presbyterians? I knew there were at least a couple among us. How many of you are Methodist? How many of you are Methodist? Let me see your hands higher. It's like three. Four. Four, okay. Any Lutherans among us today? Two? Three. Three. One in the back. Oh, sorry. Didn't see you way back here. Can you move down closer? Yeah. Do you want to Good job. 
That would help us all if you in the back could move down closer. Then we can see. So college is how many call the prayer of the day? It's called the prayer of the day. Yeah. Like collect. <laughs> yeah, you spell it just like collect. And um, the reason it's called collect is because it gathers together. It collects the words of scripture. It collects the hymns that we're going to sing that day so that all that we're going to do, it collects everything that's in the worship service in order that it would be unified, that it can be coherent. So that's a very important point in the worship service. And those who, um, we can write them or they are given to us in the lectionary, which gives us the text for the day and the collects are according to the theme of the day. So last Sunday was what, 20? How many Sundays after Pentecost are we? Eight. Eight, Eight Sunday after Pentecost. And that enables us to gather together what the themes of the day are. I remember this previous Sunday better because I was preaching on it. <laughs> All right. After the collect, the next thing in the order of worship from the ancient church is the um, first lesson. And the first lesson is set up by the early church fathers to match the gospel lesson. So the day when the New Testament lesson was going to talk about the Sabbath and keeping the Sabbath, there was a First Testament lesson from Genesis about the keeping of Sabbath um, and God's creation of the Sabbath. So oftentimes the first lesson, or the day that the New Testament lesson was talking about um, Jesus being taken up in the Ascension, which is celebrated in some... Um, uh, Catholic yes. churches in August. Yeah. Um, the same day, the First Testament lesson will be Elijah being taken up in the whirlwind. Connects the, the, the yeah, connects the testaments. You might have noticed that I call it the First Testament instead of the Old Testament. Um, it's because I've had too many people complain to me that the Old Testament isn't necessary to be read. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it really helps us to see that God gave us this whole book, and the entire Bible, and that the entire Bible ties together. That many things are antityp are antitypes in the First Testament that reveal to us the typology of what Jesus all fulfilled in the New Testament. And so, as we see that unity, that unity is presented by the order of the day. Testament lesson, oftentimes a psalm verse is sung, or a psalm is spoken. And the psalm, at that point, functions to give us transition between the two Testaments, so that we can realize more and more they are bridged, and that the same God is working in the First Testament as is working in the Second. And what I especially love about the song being a part of our worship services is because we know that Jesus, in his synagogue worship, sang the psalms. Every psalm that has a title on it to the hymn director, or to the choir director, or to the chief musician, whichever translation your Bible is, um, those psalms were sung in public worship. And we sang the same songs uh, from the psalm collection in our worship services so that we join in with our Jewish brothers and sisters and therefore Jesus in singing the same psalms on Sunday mornings that they sang. 
So there's a bridging of our worship between what Jesus did and what we do. That's a wonderful awareness that we have when we sing a song every Sunday morning. And one French lady, I don't know her name, she has recovered some of the melodies that David sang. Um, and the interesting place where she got them is from the Samaritan people who still exist in Samaria. And, um, you know, they have pulled apart from the Jews and were massacred, like many of the Jews were massacred by Hitler. And so some of them still exist in Jewish communities in Samaria. And through them, she learned some of David's melodies. The next piece is the epistle lesson. The epistle lesson usually ties in, or else in some congregations they're reading through the epistle. So for example, I was in a congregation a couple weeks ago that was reading through 1 Corinthians. And that enabled them to get to know the things about the Corinthian church a little bit better and see that we have some of the same flaws as the Corinthian church. <laughs> And realize there's no new sin. There's nothing new under the sun. Vanity of vanities. To quote Ecclesiastes. Between the epistle lesson and the gospel lesson, there used to be a piece called the gradual. And I thought that was a very interesting name because it meant you gradually move from one to the other. And oftentimes today, the gradual becomes um, the question in John 6 when some of the disciples are going away and Jesus asks them, will you go away also? And the disciples answer, Lord, to whom shall we go? So in uh, the Lutheran church in which I was a couple weeks ago, they sang, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. That was the gradual. Yes, that the, um, uh, the gradual was for movement, he asked, and I don't know if you heard him. Um, there was a procession at that point, and the gradual was for movement when the priest would come out into the center of the congregation and read the gospel. And the gospel was read from the center of congregations. That's so, still done in some churches. Oh yes, it, it still is done. Um, the, it's read from the center so that we can remember that Jesus spoke among the people. And during that gradual also, um, usually the congregation rises in honor of the gospel. Now that same function is undertaken by some music in many churches. Um, and that music is uh, usually splendiferous. I've uh, been in congregations where they, they do the procession with the sound of trumpets and uh, the people sing a spectacular uh, glory to you, O Lord, is sung before the gospel lesson and praise to you, O Christ, is sung after the gospel lesson and that music also is used for movement um, when the priest comes into the center and that processional triumphant fanfare is so that we really recognize the gospel as directed to our daily life, that we want to bring the gospel into our living. Um, uh, once I was at a camp, and there was a Spanish lady among us, and we didn't, I didn't know very much Spanish at the time, I was just learning it in preparation for going to teach in Mexico that fall, and so I had my Spanish Bible along with, so in honor of the Spanish lady, so she wouldn't be left out of worship, we always read the gospel lesson in Spanish. And so we decided the 
the little ditties that you sing before and after the gospel would be sung in Spanish. So we sang um, that, that one that we sang yesterday in worship. Was it yesterday? Uh, what was it? it was uh, Gloria in, in, en, los, en los cielos. Yes. yes. Um, uh, porque por, uh, por siempre. We sang that one, and everybody in the camp learned some Spanish <coughs> so that we could identify with her and so that she didn't feel isolated. And so every night we, in the camp worship service, we would sing that Spanish song, and then we'd have the reading of the gospel in Spanish, and then we'd sing another Spanish song while the, uh, we went out of the center of the congregation to preach the sermon for the evening. Then comes the gospel lesson. And I already emphasized that we want to stand during the reading of the gospel because Jesus is present in our midst, and we want to stand in honor of him. I always feel funny when I'm in congregations where they don't stand for the gospel, because I want to honor the presence of Jesus Christ. Since we sit for the other lessons, I want to say, Jesus, I'm so grateful that you are present in our midst. And that's why all these songs before and after Usually, after the gospel is read then, and the gospel is proclaimed as clearly as possible. Um, if I'm preaching on the gospel, I always try to memorize it, just for the sake of being able to proclaim it clearly. And it also helps me prepare my sermon. Then the people usually sit, and at that time there's usually the sermon. Now, the sermon, let me stress, should not be anything anybody can read off the newspaper. We might use something from the newspaper to introduce it. But the point of the sermon is to give a message that you can only hear in the presence of God's people. So that the sermon always contains a truth of the gospel. Remember how they, they used to say, well, this is years ago, but when Bill Clinton was campaigning for president, um, somebody said that on his desk it would say, it's the campaign, stupid. So don't forget about that. That's what's central. Um, I was once a guest preacher in a congregation in New York City where uh, I climbed into the pulpit and there Underneath the pulpit stand was a great big sign. It's the gospel, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that we're always preaching the gospel. I'm not a preaching professor, but, um, and you're most of you not preachers. But I, I can't help but stress that so much because I've heard so many sermons that are not gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let me give an example. The sermon um, I heard a couple weeks ago, I don't want to blame any particular person, so I won't tell you where it was. <laughs> it was a sermon on the parable of the Good Samaritan. And kind of the point of the sermon was now, now go and you should be like that. You should is not gospel. That's not very free. That's kind of legalistic. You should shape up. You must. You ought to do this. You have to. Those are law words. Instead of gospel means freedom. So it's what our delight is. Um, if we really read the Good Samaritan parable, its point is that we're the one that's been robbed. We're the one that was traveling along the road. We're the one that the priest and Levite walked by. 
We're the one that got rescued. And Jesus Christ is the Good Samaritan. That Jesus Christ rescued us. And so that's good news. The gospel good news from the Good Samaritan parable is that we were set free by the gospel. And because Jesus Christ rescued us, we are brought to God's place of healing. And therefore, in the name of the triune God, we are set free. Amen? Amen? Does that make sense? Yes. Does that make the parable of the Good Samaritan sound like grace instead of law to you? Yes. Good. The next piece that would often be used in worship services is a sermon hymn. And we want to make a sermon hymn that comes as close as possible to the theme of the sermon. That's why the musician needs to get from the preacher the topic of the sermon before, because many times in worship services, many people plan that the choir anthem will be the response to the sermon, which is a very nice idea. I prefer to have it be a whole congregational hymn so that the entire congregation can respond and say, yes, this is what I heard. I heard real gospel in that story today. And because I heard gospel, I am set free. And here's how I'm going to respond in my daily life. This is the character that I want to take into myself. Um, that's the kind of things we want to plan in our sermon hymns. So those of you that are musicians and are part of the planning of the service, I would encourage you highly to make it with the, the same kind of theme as possible if you can get your preacher to cooperate with you, which is not always the case, but sometimes. Anyway, it emphasizes the theme of the day. The next piece, which I know Baptists don't use, is a creed. And I want to stress the value of a creed for those of you that do who you do use it. That the statement of a creed enables people to learn a short summary of their faith. And if you if you say the creed every Sunday, you wind up memorizing it. Um, there are three basic creeds that many churches use. One is the Apostles' Creed, which is the shortest. and was um, configured early in the church. People think within the 80s or 90s. Then the Nicene Creed, which came out of the Council of Nicaea. And at that council in 354 AD, I think I've got the date right, 376? write it down. The Nicene Creed came out of the Council of Nicaea, and the Nicene Creed is a little more extensive because it um, handled certain doubts that had arisen in the faith, and so the Nicene Creed settles those doubts. And the value of creeds, then, is to say this is the unity of the church, that we believe this, and it was a very helpful tool for people to repeat and teach. The Nicene Creed is usually said on Communion Sundays, which more and more churches, thank God, are making every week. Um, I wish it were every day, because I love to receive Communion. Um, and I'll talk about that later. Oops. Um, I just noticed it's on the Um the creed, there's another creed, it's called the Athanasian Creed, which came later in the church. And the Athanasian Creed was to emphasize that God is one God in three persons. So the Athanasian Creed is usually said on Trinity Sunday. And if you have any access to it, it's very interesting to have the congregation recite it. 
because it keeps saying things like, um, the Holy Spirit is God, Jesus is God, and the Father is God. But there are not three gods. There is one God. There is one God in three persons. And then the next line will say, God the Father has compassion. God the Son has compassion. God the Spirit has compassion. And yet there are not three compassionate gods. There is one God. So it's an emphasis on the three in one. And we need that, I think, at least once a year. <laughs> I think it's, it's um, pretty long to be memorized, and it's difficult to memorize because it keeps repeating itself in the same old way. But, uh, well, actually, it's not in the same old way. It's in new ways every time, and that's why I love it. Um, but the Athanasian Creed is used to affirm the unity and trinity and the trinity and unity. And you can see why that would be necessary when the East and West split. Because they split over the unity and the triunity of the Trinity. And the Eastern Church to this day more celebrates the unity of God. And the Western Church to this day more celebrates the three persons. And that comes out in the Greek translations. Um, because the Latin translation talks about persona, whereas the Greek translation talks about hypostatis, which is the being, the substance, whereas the other is more person. So it's three persons, but one substance. And that's been, unfortunately, the division between East and West to this day. Um, I'm glad that there's always conversation between the Catholics and the Orthodox so that someday they might unite again. Um, that would be very good because the church needs both sides. We need the three and one and one and three. Yes? Yes. Well, anyway, for those of you that don't use creeds, I just thought I'd make you a little bit hungry for them. <laughs> uh, well, I found out their practicality when I went to a world youth conference that was held in Australia in the year 2000. They called it Millennial Turning Point, and uh, they invited us from all different countries to come. And I had a small group that had people from eight different countries, including Brazil and, and Australia and New Zealand and so forth and so forth. And they asked us each to give a short summary of our faith. And the other people in my group were sort of struggling to give a short summary of their faith. And I just recited the creed. And they said, what a great summary. Oh, thank you very much. They give us leeway on these immunosuppressants so that if we make a mistake and don't get it exactly at that time. But um, one time I didn't get it at the hour in the morning. I got it later in the afternoon when I discovered my pills were still there. And I called the kidney clinic and said, what do I do that I didn't get my kidney pills early enough? And they said, well, you just lost one brick out of your wall. <laughs> it's a wall of defense around your kidney. And I did indeed lose a brick. So. I try to take it pretty promptly. Thank you for helping me know it was 10 o'clock. Thank you. I thought you were holding up your creep, your hands, and I should stop talking about them. <laughs> after the prayers. Oh, sorry, I didn't see your hand. <laughs> 
I was brought up in the evangelical tradition and, and can remember being told that while well, these denominations like the Lutherans and Catholics and Presbyterians have all this stuff they chant and say and it's just kind of cold and you know, we don't do that. But as I got older and uh, was a Methodist for a while, a Lutheran congregation, and became Presbyterian, it was such a learning experience. It's gratifying to have these things to hold on to. Mm -hmm. And uh, when my sister has visited our congregation, she's in the Nazarene Church, uh, some of this is, is different to her, but yet when you recite the Apostles' Creed, that's it Whoa. in a nutshell. That is just what we believe. Yeah, there's a whole more of stuff you can say, but that's it. And I, I find that yeah. so wonderful. Yeah. 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 Uh, that prayers and things that the pastor chooses hit things right on the, right on the head. It's not just something somebody comes up with in the last minute. And, and I, I find that very satisfying spiritually and intellectually as well. Can you all hear her? Yes. yes. That was a wonderful testimony. Um, that's what I love about this auditorium. We can hear each other really well. Um, that's a wonderful testimony to the fact that the early church used these pieces for that very reason. That they told us things very clearly. And I have found that in saying a creed, or let's say a memorized prayer for confession that's been used throughout the church for ages, um, every week it hits me differently. I might say it every Sunday, but those words never get old. They're always fresh um, because I realize that there's sins that I never thought about before in confession or that's something about Jesus that I haven't contemplated lately and I need to think about that more because of what does it mean. Uh, last hour we were talking about abiding and abiding has so many different meanings to it and how do I really abide in the presence of Jesus and as I think about Jesus, because we say words about him in the creed, it calls to mind ways in which I hadn't thought about before. So there's th these pieces, I offer them to you not because uh, they're tried and true, although that's also very true, but because they're always fresh for today. And they, they relate to the uh, problems of today. And they're also, uh, I've heard young people say, it's so nice to have something that lasts. When everything is fleeting away in a technological society, when everything is outdated within 15 minutes, you know, by technology, as soon as you have a new program, there's something better already invented. Um, it's nice to know that the Word of God always lasts. And there's just such joy in when you're speaking that creed, and you just joined with that great cloud of witnesses. I mean, they're, they're all speaking that creed together. It's yes, incredible. that's that's a very good way to put it too. That the cloud of witnesses is there, as it talks about in Hebrews, and because of that cloud of witnesses, we are strengthened in our faith because we do not stand there alone. I yes. I was in a service once where the pastor had the congregation turn to to the center where they were, you know, the side was facing the side. I think we were in, for the creed, and we. Um, said the creed to each other. Mm -hmm. I, I remember that. It was, it was meaningful. Yes, that's a very important thing to say to each other <clears throat> once in a while. And it isn't a prayer to God, it's a statement to the world or to right. whoever hears it that this is what we believe. And the more we practice saying it to each other, the more we can say it to the world. Yes, another hand. Oh, when I was raised in Methodist. Memorizing the communion service so I could pray with my eyes closed. And, you know, uh, but then I've been married to a Baptist minister for 57 years. So uh, I've been a Baptist, closet Baptist. No. <laughs> but then the Baptists uh, often uh, say, oh, you, we mustn't have printed prayers. Oh, that's, that's really ritualistic. And so, so many people are so afraid of printed prayers. And yet I discovered that. Uh, the people who are against printed prayers, when they just pray extemporaneously, 
say the exact same phrase all the time <laughs> and ask for God's richest blessings, how will be there, ask for well, anyway. And, and, and so that they're using the same words, but they just have a real uh, objection to printed prayers. And uh, I think that's funny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, and so those of us who do have these gifts offer these gifts as pieces to other denominations. And um, what you said before about, what Joyce said before about um, uh, those who pray extemporaneously always fall into the same patterns. That's one of the reasons why I love printed prayers. And many devotion books come out with a prayer for evening and a prayer for morning so that we widen our prayers and we are always led into deeper and deeper prayers by use of the gifts of others and as we as we keep keeping the, these particular pieces of liturgy as treasures to be shared rather than as things to fight over whether or not you do it um, but it depends upon each congregation which pieces we use and we use those pieces for the sake of deeper worship <coughs> So whichever pieces are not used in your local congregation, you could make sure you put those pieces in your own devotional life for the sake of deepening our faith through the gifts of these pieces. Yes? And that's why I wanted to make sure that we went through all the pieces this morning. I better hurry so that we can get some more. One of the reasons why I love the prayers of the church is that they constantly narrow. Um, they start with the whole church throughout the world. And um, we pray for the entire church. So, for example, we pray now for missionaries who are trying to preach the gospel in some of the closed countries, like Myanmar, and um, places where people are being persecuted for their faith. And... Um, I heard a NPR sequence the other day on churches in China and Christians being persecuted formerly by the communist regime, but that now there's not as much persecution and Christians are being able to be more and more open about their faith. And um, so we pray for the church in China that um, God would enable them to um, flourish in their faith. Uh, we pray for the church at large. Then we pray for the church a little more narrowly, or we pray for particular governments. Um, that's one of the reasons why I look like the Book of Common Prayer, because the Common Prayer follows that order, that we start with the world, then we come down to our country, then we um, pray, for, you know, and in following that, um, what I love about the Anglicans is that they pray every week for the Queen. And Anglicans in the U.S. pray every week for the president. And not all denominations do that. <coughs> Lutherans do sometimes. I've run into that. So as we quote, narrow our prayers and get more and more local, then finally we pray for the needs of our local community. And especially I want to pray for peace and justice in those 
in those areas because in a lot of communities there's rioting these days. In a lot of communities there's a lot of hatred between the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, that's why I always say I'm a Republican. <laughs> or I'm a Republican. Because <laughs> I try to be a bridge between the two and reconcile them together for the sake of the unity of God's people and for the sake of the unity of the political world too, so that we can work for the good of all. So that, that's why I like set prayers that um, wind up with praying for local needs and people who have local concerns. Um, we always want to put legs in our prayers, and I think that's really essential. We always want to not just say words, but if I pray for someone who is ill, Maybe I'll go visit them in the hospital, or maybe I'll send a card, or maybe I'll stay away because I made a bill. You never know. Did, you know, didn't seem to get that. <laughs> anyway, um, maybe we just assumed it was true. That I made the <laughs> anyway, um, so that narrowing of the prayers to have very large prayers and pray for the whole world so that we think more largely about our faith, but that we finally get down to a community where we're able to do something about it. The next piece is offering, and um, an offertory that's sung during offering, that's often a place where the choir anthem is, and then you want it to be some sort of song that talks about commitment to God, and that we commit not just our physical offering, but our physical <coughs> selves. Um, I especially want to stress that uh, we give not just our head and our hearts and our tithes, but we want to give our whole lives, we want to give our bodies into the service of God. Um, the next parts are all in connection with communion, and um, it's time for us to quit. And I know that uh, you all have a long walk over to the uh, Truett Seminary for um, the next singing, choral reading, um, so I don't want to take too much time, but let me emphasize that communion, the actual Eucharist, is past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. That it's remembering the past and Jesus giving us his body and blood in death and resurrection, but that we have the presence of the body and blood now, how our various denominations understand that, I know there's a lot of differences in our understanding of that, um, but it's also the future. We look forward to the feast to come, and we look forward to that great day when there's no more barriers between us. Um, but we want that communion to be a very explicit statement that there are no divisions between us. So it's especially wonderful when people of different races commune together, people of different cultural abilities, people of different understandings uh, that we communion to get, commune together so that we think about the reconciliation of the church and how God is always working for reconciliation. Yes? yes I have a question for you. I'm a teacher and a conductor. And I wonder, philosophically, as an undergraduate, the very first semester of music history and appreciation from undergraduates, memory is to be back. They memorize all the topics of the mass are. And they memorize all the ordinary things, mm. but they really don't experience liturgy in its form and function of the work of the people. Mm. And so we lose them. I'm the part of the girl, but I conduct a in the church. And so I wonder what we can do as a teaching institution to encourage our students, whether it's here at Baylor or any other university, to experience liturgy and the work of the people so that they begin to have understanding and its importance in worship. Mm. I, don't, I don't have any easy answers to that. Um, we especially want them to know what it means and encourage them to visit other churches so that they can experience the power of that liturgy in different places. 
young priest sat by me on the organ bench and said, go, go, go. Mm -hmm. So I began to understand what the function mm -hmm. of the people is, and it made me appreciate it all in a new way. And mm -hmm. I wish that we had as a, as a teaching institution some way to require that they understand really, you know, in a, in a kinesthetic way, mm -hmm. what the function is of liturgy. Let's yes. I want to close with prayer. Right. Let's pray before you all have to run off. Thank you for the privilege of being together. Thank you that your word is central in our lives, and we want that word to speak to us clearly every, every day. Especially we pray for this hour that whatever has been of you, that it would um, make sense in our minds, and that we might think about it later and contemplate it more deeply and pass it on to other people. Whatever has been of me, may that be forgiven and forgotten for the sake that what would be the end result of this class would be that you would be glorified and the world would be reached for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name and by your Spirit's power, most gracious Father. Amen. Amen.